What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Hashtag Ask GSM, episode 410, here today for Wednesday, October 6, 2021. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop your questions down below in the comments on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights. I forgot this week. I apologize. I was out actually seeing Venom 2, which was a great movie, and that post credit scene was fucking wild for those that haven't seen it yet. Um, but nonetheless, you can also drop a question down below in the comments section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Lots to look forward to this week. We already had my interview with the MLW World Heavyweight Champion, Jacob Fatu, go up on Tuesday in video form. Tomorrow should be my interview with Matt Cross, also of MLW. I might put it up today. Not sure. It'll probably definitely be up tomorrow, I think. Um, can't confirm that, but I'm pretty pretty sure it's going to be up either today or tomorrow or at some point in the next couple of days. Um, again, fellow MLW star talking all about MLW Fightland before it airs tomorrow night on Vice 2, or rather 10 p.m., immediately following Dark Side of the Ring. Uh, let's get right into your questions, guys, for episode 410 here today, starting with no Laura from YouTube. Their questions were... Um, do you think it was a good idea for Becky Lynch to go to Raw after the draft pick? And uh, what would be your top five worst Halloween series characters from 1978 to 2018? So, uh, the second part of your question there, the Halloween part, I have no fucking clue. Um, I've only ever seen the first Halloween movie. Most of the second, I watched it as a kid. My mom walked in on me watching a nude scene, and like, not because I was only watching that scene from the movie, but, like, we were watching the movie, me and my fucking five-year-old brother, six, seven-year-old brother at that point, probably, yeah, probably, like, seven or eight years old, we're watching this movie, and then, of course, there's one nude scene in the entire movie that just so happened when my mom wa- happened to walk in, and uh, we never finished the movie, <laughs> I don't think I ever finished it after that, Halloween 2, if you've seen the movie, you probably know what I'm talking about, anyway, back off my tangent there, um, Yeah, so I've seen one, two, I saw the reboot. I've seen parts of the sequels. Um, I know Paul Rudd's character was not very popular. There were other characters that weren't very popular. I haven't seen enough of the movies to really say, oh, this is the worst character. I fucking love the reboot. I love the reboot. I talked about the reboot last week. I forgot to mention my horror movies or, you know, Halloween movies that I watch every year. I forgot to mention three of them. I don't know how the fuck I forgot to mention Hocus Pocus. It's not a scary movie. It's a Disney movie, but I like watching that every October. In addition to It 1 and It 2. It 1 was a great movie. I don't know if I've seen It 2 since it you know, came out two years ago. I really enjoyed It 1, though. It 2 was also very good. I thought It 1 was awesome, though. I really, really enjoyed that one. So to answer you know, some additional answers from uh, John Ritland's question from last week. So I can't really say who the favorite or rather worst Halloween series characters are from the franchise because I haven't seen enough of the movies to really say. As far as Becky Lynch going to Raw, was it a good or bad draft pick? I don't love the idea of her going to Raw, but she kind of had to. Um, so here's the thing. And this is one like little decision from one network really changes everything. I said last week here on the show... I, the Becky was not among the people I wanted to see switch shows. Charlotte Flair was not among the people I wanted to see switch shows. Bianca Belair was not among the people I wanted to see switch shows. I don't think any of those women really needed to switch shows. I would have gone with Bailey. Um, I can see because you don't want two horse. I mean, actually, if you had Charlotte and Bailey, that's decent enough because Bailey's going to be back at some point, and then SmackDown has Becky and Sasha. I thought that made sense. The problem is that it reportedly Fox wanted Charlotte on SmackDown. So if you take Charlotte, then Raw has got to get Becky. If Raw gets Becky, then Raw has got to get Seth Rollins because they're married. Um, and if you bring Becky over to Raw, Bianca's got to go too because you got to finish that feud. And you can't just finish it in Crown Jewel. Like you got to give it a couple more months, I think. Maybe lead into TLC or whatever. Maybe finish it off there. Assuming they do TLC in December, I don't know. Um, that would be like one example of a TLC match actually making sense if they blew off the feud of that pay-per-view. But anyway, um, I don't love the pick. I really don't. I looked at the draft picks, and they've really drafted the entire, like literally the entire SmackDown women's division over to Raw. Bailey is not there yet. Will will probably be there. Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Tegan Knox, 
Liv Morgan, Carmella and Liv Mor- or, uh, Carmella and Zelina Vega. What's the point of a fucking draft if you're just going to draft the entire division from one show to the other? Are Liv Morgan and Carmella can continue to feud over on Mondays instead of Fridays? It's the same shit we were seeing before, so I don't really understand that personally. Um, as far as Becky going to Raw, like I said, I just didn't think it was necessary, but they kind of had to. If Charlotte was going over to SmackDown, you can't leave Raw without any four horsewomen, obviously. So, um, yeah, not a big fan of the move, but at least they moved Bianca too, so they are on the same show. At least that makes sense. Um, I would have been bummed had they not, you know, put them on the same show. I thought that would have been incredibly fucking dumb to uh, break off the feud at that point because there's still a lot more to do and accomplish with that feud before they wrap it up. Um, Let's see, going to the Twitter questions. At Iwagu91, got a couple of questions here. First one being, is it no surprise to you that Bobby Lashley was ranked third in the PWI's uh, top 500 this year. Yeah, no, I guess it makes sense. I love Bobby's at a hell of a year. It's all kayfabe shit, and it's not like, oh, from January 1st to December 31st. Their window is weird. It's like July 1st to June 30th. I mean, I guess that's like the next best thing. It's like a half year to a half year, but it's still weird. Bobby had a great year to year. I mean, he was champion from March all the way through the end of the period, But even prior to that point, he was U.S. champion for almost that entire time. He won the U.S. championship in August. He didn't suffer many losses. He only was ever pinned, I think, by Drew, maybe, by Riddle, and maybe Kofi in like a tag match. Xavier Woods, too, which was fucking stupid. But beyond that, he didn't really lose a lot. He was champion, either U.S. champion or WWE champion, for the better part of that year. Uh, that year period. So him being number three, if it's all kayfabe stuff, it makes sense. I'm not even really sure who else would have been three. I forgot who else was four. Uh, I I forgot the remainder of that list. I don't think anyone in New Japan really had as good of a year as Bobby Lashley or Impact or even anyone else in AEW. I mean, there were a couple of good people, but no one else really came close. So Bobby being number three made sense to me. Um, his second question for now, do you consider Brian Danielson versus Kenny Omega to be the best one-on-one belt in AEW's existence? <sighs> yeah, maybe. So that's the thing. And we've talked about this before because I think someone else asked me, like, what are the best matches in AEW history? All the matches that came to mind were not singles matches. The matches that came to mind for me, well, I mean, I guess one would be Cody and Dustin. I don't know if I would say that was the best AEW match ever. But it is probably in the top three, I would say. That's up there. Um, fuck, man. I know, like, the Bucks versus Page and Omega would be up there. I would put the Bucks versus FTR up there. The Young Bucks versus the Lucha Bros from All Out recently. Those are three of the best AEW matches of all time, right there. What I, I mean, you said one-on-one bout. So what other one-on-one bout would be in that conversation? Thunder Rose and Brett Baker would be up there. I'd probably put that in the best matches in AEW short history. No other women's matches that come to mind, but that one certainly would. Better than the Omega Moxley death match or the Lights Out match. I would put it above both of those. Um, I'm trying to think. Obviously, there were many more. Those are the two that come to mind. Uh, there was a great Omega Phoenix match at the beginning of the year for the championship on Dynamite. I love that match. Hmm. I don't really know. It might. Honestly, Brian Danielson versus Omega from Dynamite recently, which is weird because it ended in a draw and it was an amazing match. I don't know if I would go so far as to say it was the best they've ever done one-on-one, but it very well might be. Cody and Dustin, I could see an argument being made for that. Beyond that, though, I'm not really sure. I actually love the Omega Pack match. I'd probably put that in the best matches conversation for AEW in its short history. The Iron Man match from earlier on in 2020. Um, if that's not the best, it's one of the best. This was probably better than that. I'd have to go back and watch it again. I haven't seen it since late last year, but, uh, cause they rewatched it on like New Year's Eve or something. Yeah, it would, it would probably be in the conversation. I mean, it obviously is in the conversation. Is it number one? I don't know. If it's not number one, Daniel Omega, that is, it would probably be number two or three behind Cody and Dustin in Omega and Pack. Beyond those, I really can't think of another match that would top the list. Omega and Paige had a great match of full gear to open the show last year. I don't know if it was one of the best ever, but it was a great match. There's been a lot. Omega and Phoenix, like I said. Um, 
I don't know. I'm sure there's more. The thing with AEW is that the matches are always so good that it's kind of like the norm for a great match to be a great match. You need like a super special match to really break out and be amazing and really be remembered as one of the best. I'm sure there's some that I'm missing that I'm just not thinking of. Um, those are the ones that come to mind now off the top of my head. At Iwagu 91s third question, who do you see winning the King of the Ring and Queen's Crown? Honestly, I have no idea. I, without knowing who's in each tournament, I have no clue who's going to win each one. Probably Shayna Baszler for Queen's Crown. She makes sense. She's been on a tear lately. If she wins, maybe she can get a championship match against Charlotte or whoever. So I'm going to say Shayna for the Queen's Crown. For the men's, I have no clue. In a perfect world, I give it to I would give it to Xavier Woods. Now, that sounds laughable on paper, but if you know, first of all, he beat Bobby Lashley a few months ago, but if you know how hard he's been pitching to get King of the Ring back, and not only to get King of the Ring back, but to be in it and to win it, the guy's going to have a fucking coronary if he doesn't, if he's not even entered into the thing, let alone win it, you know what I mean? Uh, come this Friday and SmackDown. I'm getting the hunch that he's probably not going to be in it. I don't think Vince McMahon even gives a fuck or knows about his campa- campaign to getting King of the Ring. I think Xavier knows that, which is why he's like literally screaming after his matches, crown me, crown me, crown me. Vince is thinking, why why would he say that? And then they tell him, and then they like kind of put him in there as a rib or whatever. He'd probably get bumped from the first round, but hey, in a perfect world, honestly, Big E got his moment, Kofi got his moment. I would give Xavier Woods his moment. Why the fuck not? If they were getting if they gave it to King Corbin and gave him the crown for two years, why not Xavier Woods? I'd rather see that than the New Day continue to do tag team stuff again. Them and the Usos, eh, now, eh. Maybe sometime at, at, in the distant future, but not right now. If not Xavier Woods, which it definitely won't be, I doubt he's even gonna be in it. Um, I'm not really sure. Who may I mean, yeah, King McIntyre, I mean, he just doesn't really need it. I want to see someone win it. One who's never held it before, but that could really benefit from it. You know, we already have King Nakamura. Um, I don't think he should win the whole thing. He's already the Intercontinental Champion anyway. Damian Priest doesn't really fit. I mean, I don't. whoever wins it, I don't want to see them win the crown. Let's put it that way. You know, King Ricochet I always thought would be cool. Uh, like Prince Puma, King Ricochet. Isn't that his fucking Twitter name? I always thought that would have been cool because he was in the 2019 tournament. The 2019 tournament was awesome. That was an awesome King of the Ring tournament. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking like Ricochet's on SmackDown now. He could really benefit. There's no other one name that really comes to mind. King King Keith Lee would be cool. I, again, they don't really have to call him King Keith or King Lee. I think that'd be stupid. Um, but yeah, Keith Lee would make sense. He's on a tear right now. Probably wouldn't give it to Karrion Cross. Um, might not be too kind on the initials there, so that's probably a no. Um, beyond that, I'm going to have to go with, uh, let's say Keith Lee. Early pick, I'll say Keith Lee. Perfect world, Xavier Woods, but I'll go with Keith Lee. Knowing WWE, it'll probably, I mean, actually, it can't be Drew. It can't be Drew because Drew's facing Big E, so that's not going to happen. Sheamus has already won the thing. I don't know. He, he, Ricochet would be cool too, but I'm going to go with Keith Lee. I feel like that's more practical. Um, at Supersonic X 1991, what are your thoughts on this year's draft in which NXT star should have been called up? I wouldn't mind Io Shirai getting called up to take Oscar's place minus the bad booking or Frankie Monet to be with John Morrison. I'm surprised Frankie Monet did not get called up. She literally lost an NXT days before the draft. It was the perfect time to call her up. She, there's, if she's not going to win the championship and there's nothing else for her to do there, I don't want to see her go after the pointless tag titles. I don't give a shit about the tag titles in NXT, the women's tag titles. They're just completely pointless. Just call her up. Morrison is doing a whole lot of nothing right now. He was on fucking main event a week ago. Just put her with John Morrison, and um, I think that'd be perfect. Io Shirai, I really feel like should have been called up. They should have dropped the tag titles last week and got called up because just her and Zoe Stark do absolutely nothing for me. I'm sorry. LA Knight should have been called up. I know they're calling up the people that have been rumored for a while, the theories and the Zayalees and the Aaliyahs and whatnot. I get it, but you got to be calling up some big names too. They called up Karrion way too fucking early because he's been doing a whole lot of nothing. Um, He's been winning matches, but that's about it. So I would have waited until the draft to call him up and Tegan and Chotzi and Tony and all these other people. But anyway, yeah, LA Knight would have been another one because I feel like if he's not going to be NXT champion, you could always put him in the North American title picture, but Isaiah's 
getting drafted and he has to lose the championship. I don't think LA is going to hold that. I would just put LA out of the main roster. The guy's not getting any younger. Why are we wasting any time with him in NXT? If the Cameron Grimes storyline is over, just call the guy up to the main roster at this point. It's ridiculous. Um, let's see. There is a second question. Which undrafted superstar do fans miss the most? It's obvious people do miss Bailey as well as Asuka with them being injured. Hopefully we'll get an update on them sooner rather than later. Um... Which undrafted superstar do fans miss the most? Probably Bailey, because she was killing it before she got hurt. Um, she wasn't champion or anything, but, you know, even you know, she dropped the championship about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, but she'd been doing great work with Bianca up until she got hurt. So probably Bianca. I mean, Asuka's over and all, but I just don't really see her make... I Even when Asuka comes back, I really don't care what show she's on. I really don't. Like, they've done everything with her. I feel like she'd just be better suited leaving and doing something else. But hey, if she's making money and she's happy, then who cares? But creatively, she's there's just nothing there. I really just don't care about Asuka at this point. Bailey, not that... She, I mean, she's done everything, but there's still more people for her to feud with. There's more for her to do. Her going back to Raw would be interesting. She hasn't been on Raw in a few years. So, um, yeah, I think people miss Bailey more. Beyond that, I'm not really sure who else went undrafted aside from Elias, the Lucha House Party, who gives a shit. Um, the Miz, actually, he was drafted. Um, I don't know who else went undrafted, but yeah, I would probably say Bailey off the top of my head. Their next question with Nikki Ash and Rhea Ripley beating Natty and Tamina now that they're both split, along with Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox, uh, they were split up as well. Is it time to get rid of the women's tag team titles? We should have never had women's tag team titles in the first place. Not because it's not a good idea. For example, I think Impact they have women's tag team titles. It's a great idea for them. I mean, WWE has the women to do it, <clears throat> but they never treated the tag titles like a real priority. I've, I've talked about this for years now. I don't like the idea of, <clears throat> you know, a secondary women's title because they never really treated it with the importance that they should have. Even AEW, they don't they don't really put the importance on their women's division like they should. So to do any sort of secondary women's title right now or another tag title or something would be fucking stupid. I think for them, for WWE. To, to give NXT its own pair of women's tag titles was dumb, too. Those are completely pointless. The women's roster on the main roster literally has no teams. They broke up all the teams aside from Nikki and Rhea. Get rid of the fucking tag titles. They won't, because it's going to be... A lot of people will be upset, all the fucking fans. Oh, how could you do this to the women? Well, how could you have tag titles without any teams? It's a great idea in theory. But because WWE has completely butchered those titles, no, I just can't bring myself to care. Nikki and Rhea aren't even a team anyway. I don't know. I would just get rid of the damn things. They, they won't because it's going to be seen as like, oh, you don't care about the women if you're getting rid of the women's tag titles, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they don't. Let's, just, let's admit it and just everyone involved here, the company, does not care as much about their women's division as they should. They get a lot of time. They have a lot of stars. Or they don't get a lot of time now, I guess, but... Um, there's a lot of women there, they have great matches, but the company themselves, just they don't care about the women's division as much as they once did, they don't care about it as much as they should right now. Just admit it and get rid of the tag titles. Let's stop pretending they give a fuck, because they just don't. Let's let's stop pretending they do, because they definitely do not. At Justin David Kish, um, I said last time I was called him Kid Cash, uh, Justin David Kish from Twitter, do you think that uh, next year's WWE Draft should include wrestlers from NXT UK to make the draft more interesting. Personally, uh, being a huge fan of Gallus, um, do you think they could be the next dominant trio on the main roster, or do you see them being booked differently? Um, as far as the first question goes, yeah, I think every brand should be eligible. 205 Live, and they're very just not consistent with what the rules are. So in, in years past... NXT was never included. They wouldn't even mention NXT, although the Profits were drafted from NXT in 2019. They didn't draft, for the most part, any NXT people in 2019 or 2020 for the draft. I'm not talking about the shakeup. The shakeup included NXT people to a certain extent, and the shakeup was always a dumb idea. Um, so yeah, they, they, they would include, they wouldn't include NXT wrestlers, but this year's did. And they were people that, why the fuck would you draft Aaliyah over Io Shirai from a storyline standpoint? It makes no sense. There's no logic there. There's no real explanation aside from, well, it was Aaliyah's time to get called up because she's been there for six years. That That's really the only explanation. That is the only explanation that makes sense. Um, 
So yeah, I think they should include all brands. 205 Live, if they wanted even anyone from that. I mean, 205 Live is not really a brand anymore. It's more of just like a, you know, NXT's version of main event with people they're grooming to be in the television show. It's not really the it's not really the cruiserweight show anymore. Excuse me. Um, NXT UK yeah, definitely. I mean, why wouldn't anyone want to draft a, a Walter or a Tyler Bate? I mean, honestly, I think it's Tyler Bates' time. He he's got to move on. Trent seven two. Pete Dunn moved on. He's been in NXT. They they got to move on as well. Walter, I would move him on to NXT, not the main roster. I feel like the main roster would fucking ruin the guy. I don't know where he really fits in NXT two point but I feel like even that would be a better landing spot than the main roster. Um, beyond that, though, I'm not really sure. You know, I guess they they did bring up Dewdrop from NXT UK. She didn't go to NXT first. She went straight to Raw. The women always get moved to NXT. You know, uh, Rhea Ripley, Tony Storm, Dewdrop, among other women. Tegan Knox. Um, I don't know. With the men, I feel like the men are a lot less likely to move over. The Grizzled Young Vets did. Pete Dunn did. Ridge Holland. So maybe it's not as far fetched as I'm thinking here. But I don't know. It's not like they're going to move Bomber, Dave Mastiff, or. Even Gala. So to answer the second part of your question, do I think they could be the next dominant trio on the main roster? I don't. Uh, I'm going to be honest, Gallus just bores me. I don't hate Gallus, but Joe Coffey bores me. I, I rarely see him have like great matches. He has good matches, but those matches with Walter and with Pete Dunne in the main event of those takeovers were boring as fuck. So no, I feel like you can always argue, oh, why, why, you know, these stables were never given a chance. They were, they could have gotten over, but WWE never let them, like a Sanity or something. Sanity was never the most exciting stable, but I feel like they had more potential, or they had more potential in the main roster than Gallus does. Gallus, there's just absolutely nothing there for me, as you know. Personally, that's how I feel, but um, you know, they're good wrestlers, but as far as the excitement level, or they're they generate a lot of heat or whatever. They're just not very exciting. They are perfect for NXT UK. And even then, I'm kind of bored from them. I'm kind of bored by them there. Um, I, I just don't really care about Gallus. Imperium in the main roster, again, I feel like they have a much higher ceiling. But the thing with them is that I don't think they would book Walter appropriately. And Alexander Wolf got fired anyway. So the chances of that ever happening just aren't good. Um, but even they, in their current form with Imperium, I feel like would have a much higher ceiling for success than Gallus, who just... At least Walter is special. To me, Joe Coffey is just not special. Good, average worker. Nothing real great about the guy or the entire group. Um, it's just kind of there for me. I'm sorry. Uh, at Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine. His uh, Check out his YouTube show, Real Honesty with John Ritland. Does great work there. His first question was, are these recent 24-7 championship segments accomplishing anything other than killing time and getting people on screen for like two minutes? I mean, you could have asked the same question what, uh, three, two years ago, whenever they started the damn thing, and it would be the same answer. All these segments are a complete waste of time. I mean, it was entertaining in the in the beginning. It was entertaining to an extent. You know, they got creative with Maverick and his wedding, and they were on the plane. Now it's just fucking lazy. It's lazy, dumb comedy just to kill time. It's stupid. Having a defendant in actual matches is dumb. Um, anyone that's involved in this stuff immediately takes them down one notch. Like, they immediately mean infinitely less um, just by competing for the 24-7 championship. I almost got scared for a second seeing Apollo Crews share the screen with Reggie on Raw because I'm thinking, oh no, did Apollo Crews get drafted to main event just to compete for the 24-7 championship? God, I hope not. I know people don't like the axe, but Crews is way better than that shit. That was just awful. Um, let's see here. Second question. So they're really loading up this crown jewel card, aren't they? A pay-per-view worthy card to say the least. Also, do you think any of the talents really feel comfortable traveling over there? I mean, they always, they always stack the crown jewel shows or the Saudi Arabia shows because they want to make it feel like it's like they're WrestleMania, but it's not because first of all, the shows are always terrible. They're at least abysmal at best. But they like, you know, they're in a big stadium. They want these attraction matches. They want people to watch the show. They really want to draw people in to go to the show in Saudi Arabia. So I get it. Um, I don't give a fuck about these shows because even though they kind of try to give it a WrestleMania feel, it always to me feels like a glorified house show with how they book the matches, the results, the people they bring in for it. It feels like one of those network specials and not really much of a pay per view. But I, I am mildly curious to see how they book this show. Because there are matches on the show I'm looking forward to. It's just I feel like it might be another fucking disaster as it always is. 
Um, as far as whether the talents really feel comfortable going over there, I mean, probably not after that fiasco two years ago on uh, Halloween in 2019 when they were stuck on the plane and it was a fucking mess. I mean, that shit was terrible. And we've heard all the horror stories about that plane ride, that the, the second plane ride from hell, from like Anderson and Gallows and other people that were on that flight, um, other people that have since been released. So I'm sure not everyone feels like, oh, I don't feel comfortable over there. I'm sure there's people that are looking forward to it. They don't really care. They're flexible. Other people are like, eh, I still don't feel comfortable going over there. And I totally understand that. But a lot of these people can't say no. I mean, Brian said no. Cena said no. Maybe Owens. Um, that's about it, though. Fucking Humberto Carrillo, I don't think he's saying no. And if they say, even if they say, oh, we're not going to hold it against you, you know that they will if you're not a big star. You know that they're going to hold it against them. So I'm sure they don't feel comfortable. A lot of them probably don't feel comfortable. Um, but they just get out the deal with it, and they're not going to speak out about it while they're with the company. They're just going to wait until they get released because, you know, that's what that's what you do. I mean, they're employed. They don't want to get fired. So I, I get it. Um, but it is what it is. Um, their third question, or John's third question, that is, so reports state that NXT UK will start having fans in attendance for upcoming tapings. Do you think that'll help the brand grow, or is it just going to stay a niche product? Is it going to grow? I don't think so. I mean, NXT UK has been in the same spot for literally three years. They had... The pandemic did really hurt the momentum because they had a lot of momentum, I felt, coming out of the takeovers. But the problem is that, honestly, a lot like with Impact, they would have these great pay-per-views and great shows, but then no one would tune into the actual weekly shows. And they didn't, the company themselves didn't really make a big deal about the weekly shows. I enjoy the weekly show now, but there's no fans, which really hurts the product. And it's the only show in WWE that doesn't have any fans in attendance right now. It hurts the product not having fans there, and the takeovers were always were always the best part of NXT UK, and the talent were, was just great too, um, but they haven't really exactly grown though, because again, they would do great takeovers and do packed crowds, but they weren't like, I don't think they were doing NXT UK-centric tours, were they? I know they would be involved in the WWE tours of England, I don't know if they were doing NXT UK-only tours. They were running the same buildings for the most part for their TV tapings, I feel like their peak was probably that first takeover when they first brought in Walter and all eyes were on NXT UK. Beyond that, they've had a show, they've had a weekly show now for three years. If they haven't really grown out of that and they've only taken a hit due to the pandemic, I don't feel like it's ever going to really grow beyond a certain point. It's never really going to be considered a, like a must-see product. WWE just barely promotes the fucking show. They'll air the occasional commercial during Raw or NXT or whatever, but that's about it. Um, they'll have people come over from NXT, go to NXT, because that's it's not a lateral move. It's from NXT UK up to NXT. NXT UK is like the bottom of the barrel. You don't see many people going to NXT UK because there's it's it feels like a dead brand, and I love the show, but that is just a fact. It feels like a dead brand. So having fans back in attendance will be great, but I really don't feel like it's going to make much of a difference as far as whether the brand will truly grow or not. Last question from Matt, Supersonic X1991. Who is the most successful Joshi wrestler in America, Asuka or Hikurashita? I mean, obviously, Asuka. I mean, Asuka, for all the bad booking decisions they've made with her, she was undefeated for what? Three years? Two and a half years? Former multi time Raw Women's Champion, SmackDown Women's Champion, longest reigning NXT Women's Champion of all time, Tag Team Champion, I think two time Tag Team Champion, Money in the Bank winner. Uh, mix match challenge winner for whatever the fuck that's worth. Royal Rumble winner. I mean, this woman has done it all. I thought there was another accolade. Like, oh, she's done this. Or maybe it was the Grand Slam thing. It was like Money in the Bank, Royal Rumble. Honestly, she's done so much, I don't even... Not the WrestleMania Battle Royal, right? She never won that. Let's Let's look. She's had so many accolades, I don't even remember how much she's actually done. Let's see. I know she's held every championship. She's been a Grand Slam champion. Uh, let's see here on a Wikipedia page. I know there was like another like, oh, she did this, you know. Money in the Bank, Royal Rumble. Maybe it was Maybe it was the Mixed Match Challenge. I guess that was the other accolade I was thinking of. I mean, unless she wins the King's Crown. No one's ever, they've never had a King of the Ring tournament for the women before. They are now and... I mean, I guess she could be in that. Cause she, I mean, I doubt it, though, because if she wasn't drafted, then why would she show up four days later on SmackDown? So We've seen a couple people win the King of the Ring, Money in the Bank, and Royal Rumble. I think only three people. Brock Lesnar, Edge, 
and Sheamus, I think, are the only three to have ever won all three. Corbin's won Money in the Bank, and he's won King of the Ring. Triple H has won the Royal Rumble and King of the Ring. Uh, Cena's won Money in the Bank and Royal Rumble. You know, certain people have won certain things without winning another one. Um, but those three have won all three. Uh, hopefully, at some point, she gets to win the King's Crown, and she gets to hold all three major accolades in addition to all the championships. That's why I'm bored of her, because I feel like for the women specifically, there's a lot less to do compared to the men, and there's a lot less women to face, and she's faced pretty much all the women on SmackDown and Raw, and NXT, I feel like, would be the best place for her to go. I feel like her going back to NXT and doing some stuff with the women there, a lot like Ember Moon did, might be the best course of action for her. But to answer your question, I mean, it's un- I'm not even really sure why this is a question, but Asuka or Sheeta, Sheeta was AEW Women's Champion once for a year. And even her reign, she never really felt like an important piece of the roster. She had a couple of good matches with Penelope Ford and Thunder Rosa, among other people. But she was never a focal point. She was barely on the fucking show. She's not even on the show now. She's on the... She's Tonight will mark her first Dynamite appearance since before she lost the women's world title back in May. That was five months ago. So, obviously, Asuka is the most successful Joshi wrestler um, probably ever in America, if I had to really think about it, but... Certainly between the two of them. There's no question about that at all. And that's going to do it, guys, for episode 410 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, October 6, 2021. Thank you guys for checking out the show. I appreciate it. Uh, be sure to like the que- or like the question, like the video and send in questions. You can also drop comments, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. If you want to send in a question is what, did, is what I meant to say. Um, you could do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook.com, uh, Facebook.com backslash uh, Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a question on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And be sure to, last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Have an awesome one, guys. Like I said, stay tuned for my interviews with Jacob Fatu, the MLW World Heavyweight Champion, up now in video form here on the channel from Tuesday, and my interview with MLW's own Matt Cross, uh, formerly known as Son of Havoc from Lucha Underground, great guy, awesome competitor. That video will also be up, that interview will also be up in video form, I should say, um, either today or tomorrow here on the channel. So again, subscribe, never miss a video, we do what if reviews, that's coming up on Friday, the season premiere, of our season finale of that. Um, we got Dark Side of the Ring reviews, SmackDown audio reviews, where we talk Raw Talk, Talking Smack every week, among other stuff. And of course, hashtag AskGSM every single Wednesday. So subscribe and never miss a video. Once again, guys, have an awesome one. I'm Graham GSM Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.